It's no secret that a lot of people are not a fan of how Bethesda dumbed down a lot of the RPG mechanics for Fallout 4 when compared to Fallout 3 and especially when compared to Fallout New Vegas. But one thing that most people agree on is that the changes to the gunplay and shooting in Fallout 4 are a major step in the right direction. One of the new features they added was the ability to hit people with your gun should they get too close. Now, this feature was never intended to be the sole use of attacking in combat, but what if, for some reason, your gun was nailed to your hand and you were unable to find any ammo? Could you finish the game? Well, that's what today's video is about, as I aim to find out, can you beat Fallout 4 with only gun bashing? I would like to point out that this is a gun bashing video, not gun stabbing, so bayonets are not allowed. With that out of the way, let's begin. Once we are in control, I realise something seems off. Turns out I still have the HUD turned off from getting footage for the intro. So, once we fix that, I begin spinning in place like a rotisserie chicken while we wait for the vault tech rep. For my special stats, it's essentially the exact same as my fist only run, as gun bashing damage and perks are tied to the strength tree, and having endurance and agility is good for any melee focus build. Since the rest of the intro stays the same from here until we get unfrozen, I'm going to just skip ahead a bit. Once Captain Keys releases us from cryo, we begin making our way through the vault, ignoring the rad roaches until I can grab the 10mm pistol. As of right now, the gun bash is pretty effective, but that said, few things in the game don't kill a rad roach in a single hit, so that's probably not saying a whole lot just yet. The main drawback of using the gun bash is the fact that it functions like doing a power attack with a melee weapon, which does mean that you need action points in order to use it. With that in mind, it may have been worthwhile to put a few extra points into agility. But as of right now, we should be okay. Running out of action points during combat shouldn't be an issue until we begin to face enemies with a lot more health later on. As soon as I get the pit boy I make sure to drop the 12 bullets that were already in the pistol when we picked it up. There is no rule against me carrying ammo, but I would rather not have the opportunity for my finger to slip and accidentally shoot somebody. Once I get out of the vault, as usual, I head straight for Conger to get some easy experience from fighting the raiders there. On my way, I killed two Bloodbug Hatchlings with two bashes each, so things aren't looking too bad just yet. That said, however, one of the raiders had a shotgun and she tore my health bar to shreds, and then, rather ironically, killed me with a gun bash. That's not too bad, however, as I was just being pretty careless. What is annoying, however, is the fact that I'm back at the vault, so I've got to hoof it back over to Concord before I can try again. This attempt goes much better, as I'm actually able to kill all of them. There are actually two good things about gun bashing that I noticed here. First off, since the gun bash works like a heavy attack, it will stun most enemies, which is pretty handy, because if I can time it just right, I could technically get past most one-on-one -on -one fights without taking any damage at all. And secondly, sometimes when an enemy's health is low enough, I will automatically do this two-hit kill move, which is pretty great, because while this is happening, I can cancel the animation of using stim packs for some quick heals. Another thing that's great is that once I finish off the last of the raiders outside, I'm able to level up and take the gun basher perk for an extra 25% bashing damage. This perk as well as any defensive ones are pretty much what I'll be taking for the entire run, as putting points into the perks that increase one-handed or two-handed guns doesn't actually increase the damage of gun bashing, so they will be useless this time around. Well, thanks to this added attack power, the raiders inside the museum pose very little threat and I deal with them rather quickly. For once in my life, I leave by going back out through the front door rather than the rooftop and begin taking out the raider reinforcements. However, once the Deathclaw shows up, I just run away, as right now I don't fancy my chances of fighting him. While running, I did get jumped by two Myrlocks and briefly thought about leading them back to the Deathclaw, but they weren't very interested in the idea, so I just kept running. I began making my way west. I thought since I'm in the area, it would probably be good to mark Fort Hagen on the map, as well as to try and get some experience to try and hit level 5 so I could get the second point in the Gun Basher perk. This is also where I encountered my first two Super Mutants. The one with the board was easy enough to avoid, but his friend with the pipe rifle was doing insane amounts of damage for some reason. Like I found out in the Fist Only run, however, Super Mutants stagger just as easily as any human, so the strategy quickly became circling around both of them and trying to strike them in the back whenever the opportunity was there. I was eventually able to whittle them down enough and take them out, but I ended up using most of my healing supplies in the process. This was pretty bad, as it made taking out the nearby raider base a lot more difficult than it had any right to be. Not helping matters is the fact that one of them is in a suit of power armor, and my attacks basically just bounce right off of them. After a few attempts, I figured that the best strategy was to sneak around the side and find the suit of power armor, and then take the fusion core from it. Because while the suit can be used without one, the NPCs just seem to ignore it if they don't have a fusion core. Once I had the fusion core, dealing with the raiders themselves was rather easy, as they were all still going down to about one or two bashes. What was actually causing me the most pain was the turrets, as I wasn't able to get enough hits in fast enough before they could kill me. Well, that and this dog who followed me into the back of this container. Not sure why he was the only one with a skull next to his name, but whatever. After I somehow managed to deal with the dog, I made a run for the main building and from there could use the terminal to deactivate the turrets. I also decided that I would actually loot this area first before heading on towards Fort Hagen. Once again, the majority of raiders didn't put up much of a fight, the only issues were a few annoyingly placed turrets and the leader herself, Red. Thanks to some psycho medics and jet, as well as a few stim packs I'd managed to gather while inside, I was more than able to deal with Red and from there deactivate the rest of the turrets, meaning I could rub the place blind with little to no resistance. 
Once I was finished gathering some healing supplies, I left and began heading south until I hit Fort Hagen. No point going inside as you can't actually get to Kellogg yet, so I thought it was best to go east towards Diamond City. But, more importantly, I wanted to go to Cambridge Police Station, as I felt that siding with the Brotherhood would be the best idea because it meant I wouldn't have to fight the Mirelurk Queen at the castle for the Minutemen, and also wouldn't have to try my luck at pistol whipping my way through multiple people in power armor if I were to side with the Institute. When I met up with Dance in this trip, I tried my best to help against the ghouls, but they honestly just ended up doing most of the work. With the ghouls out of the way, me and Dance headed off the Arcjet systems to get what he needed, as well as fight some synths on the way. When in combat against synths, I'm able to do an okay amount of damage with each swing, but just like the ghouls, Dance more often than not deals with them before I really get a chance. Once Dance is finished murdering his brothers and sisters and we get the long range transmitter, I get recruited into the Brotherhood. Which, as of right now, doesn't mean anything as I haven't progressed far enough in the main story for the rest of the chapter to arrive. So, with that in mind, it was off to actually begin the main quest. And this time I planned to just cut out the middleman and start by going straight to Park Street Station now that I remembered where it was to rescue Nick. Well, I say that, but since Cambridge Police Station is just around the corner from the CIT ruins and Green Tech Genetics, I thought it would be a good idea to mark those on the map now as well, so I could fast travel back here later on. I also find out that the door to Green Tech is just destroyed before that part in the story, so you can't actually get inside and fight the courser just yet, sadly. Speaking of important locations, do you know what is also close by? The Railroad HQ. So, as a running trend in these Fallout 4 videos so far, I immediately head inside and begin pistol whipping anything within a 5 foot radius. Except Pam. She isn't hostile and I'm not stupid enough to start a fight with an Assaultron this early in the game. You know, I tend to take out the railroad just because I find it convenient, but in actuality, they have a good number of medical supplies and armor that are really good to have early game, so unless I'm siding with the railroad, I may be doing this in just about every other playthrough as early as I can. Anyway, with them now out of the way, there was nothing left to distract me from saving Nick. For a brief moment, I was thinking about fighting these super mutants for some experience points as I was close to leveling up, but then I realized that this one was about to give me a death hug and so I just hightailed it out of there all the way to Park Street Station. I think I may have taken the most dangerous route there, however. If we don't count the Super Mutant Suicider, I also ran into a Mutant Hound, a pack of Feral Ghouls, some Landmines, and a few Gunners. It's honestly a miracle I was even able to make it to the station if I'm being honest. Maybe they all ended up fighting each other, who knows. The Trigger Men weren't too bad this time. They still did more damage than any Raiders I'd encountered up to this point, but being able to constantly stagger them turned out to be a big help. This was also where I learned that if an enemy that is unarmed or holding a melee weapon blocks your gun bash, you can immediately do another gun bash as soon as they block it. And since you can't hold a block for more than a few seconds in Fallout 4, it meant that the follow up attack would be a guaranteed hit. So at least melee enemies would now be simple to deal with. After I whipped the last trigger man, I leveled up and decided that I would take the cannibal part because it seemed funny and the ability to heal after every human or ghoul kill sounded like a good idea if I was low on medical supplies. This perk made the fight in the train tunnels a complete joke as all the trigger men were going down with little resistance and then whenever I did take damage I would just gobble up some of their friends. This is also how I got through the vault easily as well. I've never taken the cannibal perk in Fallout 4 before. If I knew it was this useful, I would have taken it in my fists only run as well. That's the great thing about doing these challenges, you get to try things you normally wouldn't in a game and it's awesome. Anyway, once I rescued Nick, I actually tried to see if I could talk down Skinny Malone or at the very least get Darla to back off. But, I have only a single point in charisma, so that failed and I ate them instead. I mean, how could I not? Skinny Malone's got some good eating on them bones. When we got outside, I took a very wrong turn and within 10 seconds got my legs crippled, shot by a turret, and then blown up by a car bomb. If you know anything about where I am from, then you will know that that last one hits pretty close to home. Finally arriving at Diamond City, and it's the usual song and dance for this point in the game. Trade for some healing supplies, steal the key for Kellogg's house from the receptionists, and then have me and Nick go investigate. Now, since I marked Fort Hagen on the map earlier, this is just as simple as showing Dogmeat the cigar, then fast traveling to Fort Hagen and dismissing Dogmeat. Unlike when I encountered the synths earlier with Dance, I now have a few damage perks under my belt, and as a result I'm able to stand my ground against them a little better. Something that only occurred to me in Fort Hagen however, was that I should be aiming for the synths arms so I can quite literally disarm them and make the fights easier for myself. As for the fight with Kellogg, I tried rushing him down like in my fists only run, but quickly realised that his synths would actually be a bigger issue because I didn't have a whole lot of protection against energy based damage and as such they could probably kill me pretty quickly if they had the chance. I did manage to save some Psycho for this fight and use that to my advantage to quickly dispose of both synths before focusing on Kellogg. He wound up doing half the work for me when he ended up backing himself into a corner so I just stood in front of him and blocked his escape and stun locked him until he couldn't take it anymore and exploded. Now while we can technically go to the Proven right now, I decided to head to Good Neighbor first to quickly run past all of Kellogg's memories before heading back to Paladin Dance. Once on board the Proven, I quickly meet all the important people before I raid the place of any and all medical supplies I can find. I thought about doing some of the Brotherhood main quests now, but then I remembered that the very first mission you have to do for them is clearing out Fort Strong of all super mutants. Now that on its own doesn't sound too bad, but they also have a behemoth, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to fight one of those until I absolutely have to. 
With all that in mind, I began making my way towards the glowing sea. I'm not sure if I went the absolute worst way there, but I ran into so many crabs that all wanted nothing more than to pinch my cheeks. When I arrived at the Children of Adam, we got interrupted by a rad scorpion and they absolutely demolished the poor thing. I've never actually used a Gamma Gun before, so I'm unaware if they're any good outside of fighting human enemies. If you guys would like to see a run with one, let me know in the comments. Anyway, I meet up with Virgil in his cave of scientific wonders and get the ability to add doors to the front of Green Tech Genetics, allowing me to go fight the Courser. But before I do that, however, I head back to Sanctuary and upgrade my pistol to have an armor-piercing automatic receiver, because apparently this actually lets gun bashing do more damage against armored opponents. I tested it out on the gunners on my way to fight the Courser, and I'm honestly not noticing the difference. Maybe it's only if it's a legendary mod that will actually affect the gun bashing. Ah well, regardless, I make my way up to the top, and much like Kellogg, I just tried to keep the Courser stuck in this one corner. He's only really annoying if he manages to get away from you, as then he'll start shooting. Otherwise, if you're close enough, he'll resort to gun bashing. And by this point, Pistol Punch and Pete is the master of that form of combat, so he never really stood a chance. With the Courser dead and his chip in my hand, I headed back to the Old North Church where not only did I decode the chip, but I also ate the members of the railroad I killed earlier. Even Glory the Synth. She probably tastes like corn. Anyway, moving on. By this point, I'd put this off as long as I could if I still wanted to side with the Brotherhood. It was time for me to assault Fort Strong. I decided to go there on foot as there was no point taking the Vertibird if I couldn't actually use the minigun because I would essentially just be a sitting duck while the super mutant shot at me. Unsurprisingly, the first few attempts were not going well. A group of soup mutants is difficult enough to deal with under these circumstances, let alone a behemoth. The plan was to stay by this house on the beach and occasionally pop out and bash anyone who got too close and attempt to pick them off one at a time. This obviously wouldn't work forever because as soon as the behemoth got close I would need to run away. I could handle him throwing rocks at me but if he managed to hit me with his weapon that would be certain death, especially with all the other mutants constantly firing at me at the same time. I eventually found a different building that just seemed to really mess with the behemoth's pathing however, and began circling around that building to keep my distance from him and all the while landing the occasional bash on any other suit mutants that were left. I very nearly died at one point as I was careless and got smacked by the behemoth, but thankfully he only crippled both of my legs. Thank goodness. Whenever I finally dealt with the last suit mutant and it was just me and the behemoth, I ran back to the same building I mentioned before in hopes of maybe just popping out and hitting him occasionally while hiding from him, but clearly I was overthinking my strategy because this is a Bethesda game. I mentioned that running around the building seemed to mess with his pathing before, but it turns out just standing inside the building by this window just completely breaks it, as he just stands there not moving or attacking, allowing me to hit him through the window with no risk. Well, I say no risk, but he did hit me once for some reason. But I had enough health that I managed to survive it, but then I just reset myself behind the window again and then repeated the process until he was dead. Sometimes the best weapons are not those of steel, but those of cheese. After that, all that was left was to clear out the mutants inside the actual fort itself. They proved to be a little difficult, but compared to what I just went through, it was like a casual stroll on the beach. One of the little mutant puppies did get stuck in the bulldozer, but I helped get him out of it. After all that was finished up, Paladin Dance arrived. Sure would have been nice if he came along beforehand, but oh well. To congratulate me on a job well done, Elder Maxon gives me permission to finally build the teleporter so I can get inside the Institute. This basically just has me running back and forward between building things and talking to Ingram. I thought I was going to have to go off on another side adventure when I realised I didn't have a biometric scanner as the game was pointing me to a specific location. Turns out though you can just get them from any old turret so I just travelled back to Fort Hagen as the turrets there are still deactivated so I could destroy them with no issues. I was also lucky enough for a scanner to drop on the very first one I destroyed. With that I could now finish the teleporter and enter the institute. This time I don't immediately kill father because I don't like my chances of fighting my way out and also I don't have a stealth boy this time. I also remembered that I need to try and bring Dr. Lee back for the Brotherhood. <laughs> I obviously lack the ability to just persuade her, so instead I have to head into Virgil's lab and find her proof of what exactly happened to him. Even though we know exactly what has happened to him. The sense in Virgil's lab go down rather easily. The Assaultron, however, yeah, I may have cheesed out the behemoth, but I'm still not confident to fight the mini robot Death Star in a close quarters environment. So I just evade it to the best of my abilities and grab the proof I need for Dr. Lee and get her to come back to the proof room with me. Before I could leave, I did need to introduce myself to the rest of the Institute higher ups to get the ability to teleport out. Back with the Brotherhood and it's off for another fetch quest as I need to find a fridge magnet to stick on Liberty Prime. This has me travelling to the other side of the map to a hospital flooding with super mutants. There was a suicider outside and I was initially concerned about how I was going to get past him, but a nearby baby blood bug distracted him and he not only took out himself but most of the other mutants as well. Well this is off to a great start. Inside the hospital however there was another one. I tried to see if I could fight him as maybe I could just stagger him and not have him explode. Yeah that did not work at all. Attempt number two and I just ran past him and tried to get to the magnet. Turns out however it is behind an advanced lock and Pete here, well he's quite the simpleton so that's out of our ability right now. 
At this point, I'm running around like Leon in Resident Evil 2 when he's being chased by Mr. X. All the while, I can just hear this constant beeping getting louder and louder while I frantically search the nearby rooms for a key to get past the locked door. I do end up finding it in the nurse's station, and as soon as I do, I open the door, run in, grab the magnet, and then just leg it out of there because that room is a dead end, and if he cornered me in there, I would be doomed. There's no rest for me, however, because as soon as I drop off the magnet, it's back to the glowing sea to get some nukes for Liberty Prime. There are so many reasons why that is a bad idea in the Fallout universe, but we don't have time to think about that now, as in the area right before the nukes, there's an Assaultron that I have to kill because once again, my guy has crippling social anxiety. First attempt goes as well as you would think, I hit it, it hits me back a lot harder, and I die. Next try, and I use my head by luring this glowing one to fight the Assaultron for me. He got killed scarily fast, but thankfully was able to put a slight dent in the health bar, which did help. The damage I was doing wasn't horrible, but that wasn't the issue. It was its almost guaranteed one shit kill eye beam that was the problem. <laughs> Clearly meant to be one shot. In a stroke of luck when it was just about to fire, I managed to close the door and it hit the door instead, which also gave me enough time to take out the Atom Worshipper nearby who had the key I needed to get to the nukes. From there, I went back up and was able to take out the Assault Drum before it could charge up another attack. Then, I could leave the beacon on the nukes and head back for my next mission. Well, before we get on to the last mission before the final mission, we have one tiny problem to take care of, and that is dance. If for some reason any of you watching have never played Fallout 4 before, or never sided with the Brotherhood for that matter, well, first off, play the game and side with the Brotherhood is very fun, and secondly, dance is a synth, and therefore he needs to be put down. Uh, Ad Victorium, brother. Ad Victorium, you filthy toaster. You want to know what's strange? Even though I already murdered every single named member of the Railroad, I still have to go do the Exterminate the Railroad quest for the Brotherhood. I guess I just assumed that it would be like dealing with factions in New Vegas, but apparently not. Regardless, I need to reprogram Pam, which is what I like to hear, as that's one difficult fight I didn't want to involve myself in. On the way, there are a few Railroad agents to deal with, but they're nothing to write home about, so they aren't worth spending much time on. Now for what a lot of you have probably been wondering about, it's time for me and Ingram to head off to Mass Fusion to find the Beryllium Agitator so we can fix Liberty Prime and start the final assault on the Institute headquarters. The start of this mission isn't anything too difficult, you start in a vertibird and are meant to once again use the minigun to thin out the synths on the roof, but obviously I can't do that, so I just have to wait until the vertibird takes enough damage so me and Ingram can jump out and so I can begin bashing my way at the synths. Making our way through is pretty simple. Just like an arc jet with dance earlier, Ingram does insane amounts of damage and is able to kill most of the sins before I can do anything. I may also have used her as a human shield when in the lift, but that's neither here nor there. No, what all of you are probably wanting to see is the fight after you grab the agitator in which you have to fight off a sentry bot followed by two, yes that's right, two, assaultrons. The sentry bot immediately focused on Ingram, probably because he marked her as the primary threat, and rightly so. She was able to act as a pretty great distraction while I took the sentry bot from behind until she got knocked down, at which point I ran and hid inside a room under the stairs where I could heal as the sentry bot was not able to get through. I guess thick thighs really do save lives. Anyway, after sitting in the room for a bit, the sentry bot lost interest in me, and by that time Ingram had regained consciousness, so the whole process kinda just repeated itself, except this time she was able to get a few shots in before being knocked down. So that added with my constant whipping, and the sentry bot was finally sent to the scrapyard in the sky. As for the assaultrons, well, one went after me and the other attacked Ingram. Now, I had a rather close call when I got stuck inside the room with the thing, and only managed to survive because I was able to jump out of the way of the beam in time, so it would only hurt me rather than outright atomize me. As for the other one, well, surprisingly, Ingram killed it all by herself by the time I got out of the room, so from there, we both were more than able to take down the last one through the power of teamwork. I'm actually surprised by how easy that turned out to be, but trust me, I'm not going to complain, because honestly, that was something I was worried about since I started the first recording session. With the agitator in hand, it was time to begin the walk to the pure I mean, it was time to begin the walk to the CIT ruins with Liberty Prime. Well, that's what I would be saying, but this is either an oversight on the developer's part or a quality of life improvement over how many people dislike the walk to the purifier in 3. Honestly, it could be either. You can actually just fast travel to the CIT ruins, and when you do, the Brotherhood and Liberty Prime will already be there. Now, if you thought the Minutemen made the final assault in the Institute too easy, then boy, wait till you see the Brotherhood. Hell, Elder Maxon alone with his Gatlin laser killed just about everyone and anything that even remotely looked like a synth. So yeah, any and all enemies were very swiftly dealt with thanks to the Brotherhood. I, for my part, did manage to kill a few scientists who tried to run away, so I at least get a participation medal. When I met up with Sean, I killed him because he talked back to me, and then from there, me and Maxon headed down into the reactor and strapped the pulse charge to it, and then fled the Institute and watched the fireworks together hand in hand, ending the run and proving, yes, you can indeed beat Fallout 4 by only gun bashing. 
Just like the fists only run, however, I had one last creature I wanted to take care of. So, once the epilogue was over, I fast travelled back to Concord, where Preston and the Minutemen miraculously hadn't starved to death in the museum and began my fight with the Deathclaw. It was a fight that everyone got involved in. There was me, the Deathclaw, Preston, some raiders, I even think a few Brotherhood soldiers showed up at one point. Unlike Swan, however, this Deathclaw is designed to be killed near the very beginning of the game, so he wasn't terribly difficult. So after about two minutes he was dead, and now with my bloodlust satisfied, the video could officially end. Bye bye